I'm very pleased to be talking here and I'm very pleased also that this session has got this great title, Psychedelics and General Medicine, because when I came up with this project for the first time, I was being told, well, is it really worth having such a theoretical application to be talked about? And looking into this today, I would like to say yes, because what we are doing at the moment with all those great projects going on, looking at psychedelics and psychiatry and therapy, this does a lot in the perception of the public already, changing the focus on something less pathological. But the view we have of psychedelics still is a pathological one. So it's not like, leave your hands off it at all, it's bad for everybody. But it's like, okay, if you have had severe trauma, if you're dying, you might benefit. But the public view is still, and this is not something good for everybody. And I think in the future, we will have to change the perception people have um, towards enhancing the beneficial aspects of psychedelic, psychoactive substances for the broader public. And I think this is my contribution to this. When I talk to colleagues about psychedelics, I encounter an unbelievable, well, non-knowledge. People just don't know things. They have learned about two paragraphs in the textbook in psychiatry in, in med school, which just says it's all terrible, you jump off roofs. And uh, they, they still kind of continue that narrative. I talked to a colleague who's a very, very good uh, anesthesiologist, very well known in Germany for his work. And he says, well, if you take LSD, you do get addicted after the first try, don't you? And I was like, well, no. So, um, if I would talk to a colleague, say, well, what do you think about trying a psychedelic yourself to better understand altered states of consciousness due to physical reasons in your patients? I think the look I would get would be this. Are you being serious? Yes, I am. And I'm going to explain to you why. So what I want to talk about today is basically introduce to you to two concepts, the first being acute delirium as an example of a physically caused altered state of consciousness in general patients in a hospital. Intensive care, general ward, wherever. The second will be a transformative crisis or spiritual emergency and I will try to link these two. And I'm going to do that by basically, yeah, storytelling, good old storytelling. Tell you three patient stories that I have either witnessed myself or have been told about by colleagues to make my points through this. So, intensive care and working with psychedelics, nothing in common. As I already pointed out, I do think there are things that kind of link these two issues. And if we continue with the first story. My first case, waking from induced coma. So a young guy, car accident, bad lung injury, ends up on a respirator for weeks. This has to heal, nothing to do about it, but towards the end of this process, the weaning protocol in an ICU actually has this idea of trying to wake somebody up on a regular basis. So every morning they would kind of lower the level of medication, let the pa patient come up from the coma and see whether he responds in a way that makes it, well, thinkable that he can keep breathing by himself and actually is able to become fully conscious again. So those tests involve things like lowering the respiratory rate, but also kind of touching him, shaking him, and knocking to his forehead. So this was something that was being done for several days in a row by the main carer of that person, who was at that time a very pretty uh, young nurse with very pink hair. So when this guy actually woke up after two, three weeks, he was being asked, do you remember anything from your coma? And what he said was, well, not much, but every morning a squirrel came and threw nuts at my forehead, a pink squirrel. <laughs> so he basically turned the young nurse with the pink hair in his like, imagination or in his distorted um, consciousness into a pink squirrel throwing nuts at him. So my lesson from this is there can be phenomenological similarities between a perception disorder in acute delirium and psychedelic states of consciousness. So if we go to the next slide, what actually is acute delirium? It's a big topic in medicine, especially in critical care medicine. And I'd like to introduce you through, through a pretty official definition, but this is very good because it points out all the important things. It's a neurobehavioral syndrome caused by a transient disruption of normal neural activity secondary to somatic systematic disturbances 
associated with alterations and fluctuation of mental content. I walk you through all of this, but this is kind of the central point. So this is the diagnostic criteria, the official ones. Disturbance in attention and awareness. So reduced ability to direct, focus, sustain and shift, and shift in attention. <coughs> Change in cognition, so memory de uh, deficit, disorientation, language disturbance. And all this is not being better accounted by a pre-existing condition or dementia. The third is, and this is totally typical, the disturbance develops over a very short period of time, just some few hours. People go from being pretty normal to being just totally gone into some other thing within hours sometimes. And it tends to fluctuate. Usually on an ICU, uh, the typical thing is you turn on the light in the evening and people go mad. Just what happened. So the last point is, this development is caused by a direct as, a, uh, as a direct physiologic consequence of some condition or an intoxication or more of these things. This is being seen as a very, very, very important thing in intensive care. People actually carry this chem ICU test that kind of walks you through the diagnostic criteria by little tests you can do with a patient question you can ask. People have it as a pocket card. They actually carry it around with them and do this with a patient when they have the feeling that something's wrong with this person, like mentally. And perhaps you will say, yeah, right, but you can see if somebody's turning funny. Well, they don't always react with agitation. Many people are really wild and fighting and doing stuff, but some become very calm, just in their bed, but still they're totally in delirium. And why, why is it so important? Well, there's one simple answer and a more complex one. The simple one is delirium kills. This is a very, very interesting graph. Um, we're back in Brazil, actually. This is a study that was done uh, in Sao Paulo on a large intensive care ward. Um, and what they did was, with every patient on a surgical ICU that came in for a year, so about 900 patients, they did two scores. The CAM ICU I showed to you beforehand, and the so-called Apache 2 score. So Apache 2 is very complex, very valuable, and very val evaluated. It kind of shows the level of sickness, and it is comprised of many different values to do with laboratory parameters and physical examination and all that. So basically, you can gauge by the Apache 2 score how sick somebody actually is. Low uh, Apache score means not very sick, high Apache score, really sick. And now on the y-axis, they have got the probability of death. So high Apache score, pretty likely to die. That's the, the dark gray graph. But if you put on top, if somebody suffers from delirium or not, you can see somebody who's severely ill and suffers from delirium <coughs> is up to 15%, 15% more likely to die in the course of his illness. And that's why it's so crucial. Next one, My second case. Um, Hypothermia and a chronic alcoholic. Um, even though the picture on the, le on the right might suggest something different, hypothermia is not about epically dying on the Titanic. It's about poor, sick, deprived people freezing to death in their own apartments because the providers have turned off the heating and the electricity because nobody paid the bills. This is exactly what almost happened to this patient. He was brought in in acute alcohol withdrawal, uh, totally hypothermic. He had been in his apartment without any help, no light, no electricity for several days. He came to um, the um, ICU of a very small hospital I was rotating to at the time. And in the afternoon when he arrived, he kind of looked okay still. He was responding. He wasn't too friendly, but hey, what do you expect? And um, we all thought, okay, this is going to be working out sometime, uh, somehow. When we came back the next morning, I walked into a situation where my colleagues from the night shift were trying to resuscitate that guy because he had suffered heart failure. What had happened? This guy had been masking his severity of illness <coughs> perfectly by the agitation he had through his delirium and his alcohol withdrawal. So he was fighting any attempt to help him, to warm him up physically, to give him warm infusions and so on and so on. And he, through the stress and the hypothermia, had gotten into arrhythmia and acute heart failure. And the young, young colleague who had been uh, on a surgical ward before, who hadn't done much intensive care, totally underestimated how sick this person was because he was still acting up. He tried to sedate that person, not seeing that his level of agitation actually, actually indicated that he was about to die. 
So this person unfortunately died, we didn't, we weren't able to save him. But that's what happens if we don't keep this concept in mind. Next one, please. So the lesson from this was acute delirium can mask the severity of sickness and therefore pose a significant threat to the patient's prognosis. And this sh should be on everybody's mind who's working with these patients. Next one, please. Right. What That's looks good. like the ground plan of a nuclear power plant <laughs> actually has the, the, the heading etiology of delirium. And I've only put it here because of this. It says a basic pathological model. <laughs> <laughs> Basic. Um, when you boil it down to one straight line, all that's in there says you got hypoxia due to disturbance in the system. The hypoxia makes the neurotransmitters go mad, and this drives people over the edge. Full stop. That's in there. So next one, please. When we try to treat delirium, we should be following the same principles that we always follow in medicine. So go non-pharmacological first, and then pharmacological if necessary. So non-pharmacological means Restoring your physiological, chronobiological uh, rhythm. So feed people breakfast in the morning, not at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Don't wash them 3 o'clock at night and turn the lights off when they're supposed to sleep and not have them in an environment that is bright lit for 24 hours. It doesn't happen on an intensive care ward. You do those things that are seen as stuff that needs to be done like to maintain the patient when you've got time for it. Cognitive stimulation, put somebody in a wheelchair by the window, or hand him a newspaper, or hand him some bandages to roll up, just something to do, not be stuck there with yourself in your mind. Uh, physiotherapy is very important, and also avoiding social deprivation, so visiting hours can be a killer there, so if you can make sure somebody is in contact with somebody they know, that can be very protective. Secondly, pharmacological things, sufficient analgesia, somebody who is in pain is bound to go into delirium. Alpha-2 agonists, like clonidine, they lower the noradrenaline level in the body, kind of stabilizing the system on this level. Melatonin can induce better yeah, sleep patterns, trying to bring people in a better set up there. <coughs> and the last thing is perhaps the most important, the restrictive, restrictive use of benzodiazepines. Don't fill people up with Valium. And antipsychotics should only be applied if there's a productive uh, psychotic uh, symptom complex going on, not for everybody. Right. But what happens? What happens, for example, during the night shift? This. Keeping them alive till 7 or 5. That's all you mostly can do. You've got a handful of people, 20 severely sick patients, and you try to get them through the night. And if that means sedating them till they just snore, it, instead of having them running around the ward trying to turn us, other people's respirators off, that's what you do. Next one, please. The next case um, is not about delirium per se, but it's the one that actually got me <coughs> to the whole idea of doing this. Yeah. This young lady, 24 or 25, had a very unlucky uh, comorbidity of schizophrenia and very strong epilepsy. So she suffered an epileptic fit that morning and basically uh, aspirated all her gastric fluid. So all that very sour, very aggressive liquid went into her lung and she was brought in in a total state, hardly able to breathe, very panicked. And uh, she was fighting our, all our efforts to like, establish an IV line, establish an arterial um, port to, to, to monitor her and to give her medication. And she was really fighting, her eyes closed, going like, I'm dying, I, I, I'm dying. And I looked at her thinking, okay, if I've learned anything from trip sitting people with bad experiences that, okay, this looks very much like a bad trip. So I tried basic things, tried to establish physical contact, started talking to her, made her open her eyes, look in my eyes and try to tell her, listen, look at me, you're not dying now. And by doing that and staying in contact with her, I made it possible for my colleagues to establish the IV lines we needed because shortly after that, her lung just couldn't bear it anymore and she went into respiratory failure and we had to intubate her that would not have been possible as quickly if we hadn't established the lines before. But actually, she, she made it. A few days later, she was out of hospital again, and it all went fine. But that just kind of showed um, how a patient's mental setup during such a very distressing physical experience could be very much like a, like a, a bad trip. And knowing about bad trips and knowing about different 
yeah, mental situations can actually help a doctor to cope with patients who undergo those problems. Okay. My big question in this is, so, so wh why does this happen? Well, colleagues will probably turn around to me and say, well, we told you it's neurotransmitters, it's unbalanced. Well, that's, that's how? I want to know why. Why does this happen to patients? in such a distressing physical situation. And one of the ideas that came to me thinking about things like transformative crisis and spiritual emergency was, right, a near-death experience for the, the mind, like a resuscitation situation, might be a near-death experience for the mind, but it can be a death experience for the body. And why should that not trigger, from the physical level, similar responses as the near-death experience might from the other side, if we take psychosomatic relations seriously? So, when we think about spiritual emergency or, trans or transformative crisis as something that occurs to people who ex ex experience extreme situations of any kind, any kind of trauma, any kind of yeah, very challenging situation, delirium could be viewed as this too. Just to point out a few points about this, this concept of spiritual emergency, it has been around since the 60s. It's come from since personal psychology. It has been talked about a lot, written about a lot. Uh, the first, like as mentioned in 19, I think 62 was Dijkman talking about mystical psychosis. And uh, it actually has become uh, an official diagnosis in the DSM-IV uh, uh, in 1994. And they acknowledge that those symptoms can mimic a full-blown psychiatric disorder. There are many people who think about this, work on this, like San Cristina Grof did, finding the, uh, also the uh, Spiritual Emergency Network, the SEN, they have Lukov and, and many, many others. But what they all state, and that's have the most important point, transformative crisis with a potential for development. So if we take this seriously, could such a phase of delirium not be seen as something that holds the potential for development too. Perhaps that is what the body is kind of requesting through initiating this process. Next one, please. If we look at the treatment principles for a sp uh, spiritual crisis, spiritual emergency, the, it's actually 100% opposite to what I've told you happens with patients in delirium. So very limited use of medication. Trying to understand the occurring symptoms as part of the growth process. <coughs> and encouraging working through, trying to understand the patient's symptoms within the religious and cultural belief system. This is something that isn't taken into account at all in ICU usually. usually. You treat patients and your aim is to make them survive and uh, trying to help them kind of go through this. Also considering their like, mental setup or their cultural setup is just not talked about, thought about at all. And they f this focus on the potentially positive aspects is something that could really also benefit for people who have these very difficult situations on the ICU because what we do usually is we suppress with all we have medication and so on and so on this experience so to calm people down and get over it it's just seen as something you have to suppress and, and, and get rid of <coughs> I'm almost through um, I do believe that if critical care staff, doctors, nurses, therapists, uh, spiritual caretakers would have own experiences, their own set of consciousness, experience what it means not to fully control your mental setup at a, at a given point in time, they would have more understanding and perhaps more compassion also with people going through this kind of state. And this would better the situation for patients a lot. And that might even help prevent fatalities that are unnecessary but come with our current setup. Thank you very much.